Coming up next, we have Alex Rodriguez, of course, known for his exploits on the baseball field, and my friend Jerry Cardinal, founder of Redbird Capital. And we've heard so much about we should talk to the experts. We should hear from the people who are actually doing it right now. Alex, you've got to appreciate the way I'm slowing my speech to let you slide into the seat. I mean, this was really well done. Jerry, I got to say, I know you're in Florida now, right? Yes, right. I, I missed the Jerry Cardinal on the Hamptons couch. Like, that's a thing. So, so I miss it. But thank you, gentlemen. Alex, I, I want to start with you because I think nomenclature is a great way to start this conversation. A-Rod Corp. When did you start thinking of yourself as more than athlete, as a Rod Corporation? Uh, how you doing, Scott? Thanks for um, the question and thanks for having me. You know, it started for me a long time ago. I, I had uh, aspirations to be in business uh, probably as, as long as I was 10 years old when I wanted to be a Major League Baseball player. Those were kind of my two dreams. But, you know, I was cutting deals with Jerry back in my playing days with the Yankees. He, he gave me some great advice. Uh, I was fortunate enough that he, lucky enough, that him and Mr. Randy Levine helped me get into the Yes Network deal. is a deal that I did fantastic. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> He's a great investor. Um, and also helped me out through my Yankee career with some of my contracts and Goldman Sachs and his great work. Uh, prior to him starting Redbird Capital. So I, I've always had aspirations. I've always had heroes uh, like Warren Buffett and other great, great investors. And I wanted to do baseball and business, Scott, so for a really long time. Magic Johnson told me a long time ago, he's like, because I'm magic, I could get a meeting with anybody, any CEO, Wall Street, doesn't matter. However, if five minutes into the meeting, that person realized I didn't know my stuff, they would do what every other fan did. They'd take a picture, they'd ask, for an auto, they'd ask for an autograph, and they'd shuffle me out the door. Did that ever happen to you? Were you cognizant of, I better know my stuff, it's not enough that I'm a great baseball player? Uh, 100%, and Magic has shared that story with me, Scott, as well. Magic is one of uh, my mentors, and uh, he gave me two great advice as I was kind of closing down my career. Uh, one, was to continue to do television because as you stop playing, uh, it's important for you to keep your name out there and kind of connecting to the audience. And, and number two, he said, go out and do as much uh, public speaking as you can. Go do these lectures, especially in colleges, because that's the next generation of consumer that you're going to need. And B, I do a lot of my hiring when I go to universities and talk to some of these great business schools. So yes, and to answer your question more specifically, uh, Magic, myself, LeBron, we can all get a meeting with anybody. But usually what happens is they end up with a picture and you end up with nothing. And what you wanna do is we wanna open those doors and if you come in with someone, make sure there's someone that's institutional uh, capable, someone that knows how to follow through. And then you have to get in the room and overperform, know your stuff, be humble, follow up. The prejudice that we have sometimes is well earned because a lot of athletes and entertainers, they're not willing to take, do what it takes to be playing at the highest level in business where Jerry plays for the last 25 years. So Jerry, tell me about that meeting. You know, you know Alex, great ball player, that's great, but really what am I doing with this guy? Here you are running sports and advisory at Goldman Sachs. Do you think to yourself, what, what am I doing here? No, not at all. In, in fact, you know, I, I remember Alex like it was yesterday. And, you know, what Alex said is really true, but Alex, you know, is humble in that, you know, he, I, I think Alex had this great gift that he obviously was so talented as an, a world-class athlete. He made it very clear from the very first meeting, he wanted that level of performance in business. And I will tell you, even, you know, he, he was so humble and saying, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know the things that you know, and I want you to teach me. So that humility coming from someone who's one of the greatest athletes of all time was disarming and, and it really caught your attention. The other thing that caught my attention at meeting him for the first time was woven into that conversation were terms like EBITDA and IRR 
And I was like, who is this guy? That's unbelievable. <laughs> that, like, that, that was an ERA, right? You said EBITDA, right? <laughs> it was. I was like, wow, this guy's going toe to toe. I'm, I'm impressed. And and uh, and it wasn't just some throwaway. He actually had he'd been doing work and he understood this and he, but, 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 but it wasn't enough for him. He, he approached it the way he approaches being an athlete, which is like, I want more. And, and, I, and, I, and, you know, one of the great things Alex has done is he's really made it his business. You know, the anecdote, the, the anecdote you gave of, uh, you know, just walking away with a picture, Alex has made it his business that that doesn't happen. And obviously it has to be rooted in legitimacy and substance. And, and, you know, He's he's done it. I mean, he can go toe to toe with any business person on any investing conversation, and that's that's really a credit to him. Alex, do you get the sense that athletes today, or at least some of them, recognize the difference between, hey, I just signed a lucrative free agent contract? I, I, yes, that can that can provide a multi generational security for my family, but that there's another strata that if they look around the landscape of pro sports, if they look in the owner's suite, if they look around to folks like Barry Sternlich, I saw you had him on Twitter and you were looking at a project, that there's another level. And they're not content anymore with just that baseball salary or that athlete paycheck. They want much more. Yeah, Scott, and, and maybe I'll take it a step deep. It's not really about numbers, right? It's not a, a zero-sum game. I think what you want to look at is, uh, there's a difference between W-2 income and enterprise value. And what Jerry and I try to do every day, whether it's the companies that we buy, mergers, is we want to take one plus one and make it five. And I always tell young people, I'd rather have a smaller piece of a watermelon than a big piece of a lemon. And that's something that I live by. And, and two different ways of thinking. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you see as the watermelons out there? Where is your gaze now? And I'm sure you're, you're leaning on guys like Jerry. Where do you see opportunity? And where are athletes most accepted? I mean, don't, don't, please don't tell me you got into DoorDash or, you know, just the other day. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a contrarian by nature. Um, you know, one of the things we were very proud with Jennifer is, uh, you know, she, she said no. Uh, under, under my advice, and I was very nervous, uh, where she had a, a, a pretty massive offer on a licensing deal. And what we've done with Jennifer is we've taken this uh, $8 billion consumer sales over the last 20 years, and we've converted a licensing business to an ownership business. So you walk away from 40 or $50 million of guaranteed W-2 income to create what is now called JLo Beauty, which we launched two days ago. And luckily enough for us, she's worked on this day and night for three years. Now she understands that JLo Beauty is an enterprise and we were supposed to sell out in five days and two days ago it sold out in under an hour. Uh, so off to a great start, did a, over a million dollars in sales in the first, I guess, 58 minutes. Uh, but that's an example, Scott, of saying, okay, I'll take the five, six, seven, eight million dollars per year or I'm gonna go out and build a $5 billion enterprise called JLo Beauty and one day we can maybe sell it to Estee Lauder or maybe to Redbird Capital comes in and we do a merger with them and, and that's how we think about businesses. Jerry, what are the conversations you have and Alex, I'm curious your take, do you get the sense, of, I do in the deal making world now with athletes that that licensing part of it is less attractive. What I'm hearing from athletes is how do I get myself some equity? That's sort of what we're talking about. How do I get equity in a project rather than just slap my name on something? Yeah, look, I mean, yes, but you know, the, the challenge for athletes today uh, is that we live in a world of immediate gratification. And what Alex is talking about is having the discipline to be, you know, that old Goldman Sachs, you know, uh, uh, long-term greedy principle. Um, and you know, some some guys get that right away. I think Alex got that right away. I, that was not something that he had to learn. He just knew it instinctively. It sounds like Jennifer, the same thing, you know, but it's tough in today's world. You mentioned DoorDash and Airbnb. I just found out is up a hundred percent. I mean, you know, that makes it very difficult for young people who aren't from this world, but who have intellectual property embedded in who they are. I mean, athletes, the great thing about athletes is that they have equity. I mean, it's, it's it, there's no, it, it's not a coincidence that it's called A-Rod Corp. Right. I mean, that's interesting. Right. And so, you know, I've always been thinking about 
the, you know, the fundamental intellectual property and equity value that's in the athlete and then in the aggregation of athletes and then in the leagues and the team. And so the question really is, yes, there's no doubt, Scott, that that athletes are are understanding the value of equity. But man, I'll tell you, it's a challenge because there's a immediate gratification, get rich quick, you know, you, you, you IPO and you're up 100 percent kind of a thing. And what the lessons that they really if they're going to look at a in Alex Rodriguez or Magic Johnson, I would tell you when I look at them, the thing I, I'm impressed with the most is that 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 discipline to do what Alex just said that Jennifer did. Right. Don't don't take the upfront. Don't don't say go for the immediate cash, because if you're longer term greedy, you'll build real terminal value. And that's where the wealth creation comes. And if you're and if you're all about intellectual property and that intellectual property is rooted in who you are, that's how you should set yourself up. Because, you know, the shelf life on that immediate licensing fee goes down precipitously, as Alex would tell you. Um, and it goes up dramatically and consistently if you play the equity play the right way. Alex, give me your biggest mistakes. What were your, what were your takeaways from those mistakes? Yeah, so I would say, you know, we have a very substantial real estate business, fully integrated, uh, and that's down in South Florida. I have a team of about 55. We've been able to buy uh, well over a billion dollars in real estate. Our returns have been north of 33% net of fees uh, to us, to our LPs. So it's been a wonderful business. The market's also been humming for the last 10 years and obviously we're, we're more cautious today than ever before. But down in 2006 and seven, I personally guaranteed some loans and that was a very difficult time because uh, luckily for me, I had liquidity to go negotiate with the banks and I got a huge write down, one of the largest in, in South Florida. And through a very creative deal, we were able to exit, get 15% of our, of our earnings, uh, of our profits to the bank and, and off we went. And that was the last time I <clears throat> personally guaranteed any loan. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to have my son watch this when he asks me to co-sign anything. The answer will be no. Uh, what has been the effect on the exactly. uh, pandemic on your real estate holdings? You know, because we, I would say this, we're in the right sector. Thank goodness. Um, we're in multis and we're in multis around 14 states in the southeast. Our portfolio is about 8,000 units today. Very simple, Scott. We, we buy for about $100 a key. Our rents are anywhere from $800 to $1,200. Uh, our, we've collected about 94% of, of our rents, and we've put some wonderful programs for our tenants uh, where we're coaching them, uh, we're helping them with jobs, with health care, uh, with tutoring for the kids, and, and that you know some of these kids are having a really hard time uh, with schooling at home. A lot of them don't have a computer. So we're trying to facilitate their educating process uh, as much as we can. And one more thing about what Jerry said about fundamentals that I want to kind of chime in. You know, Jerry came in an era, he went to Harvard and, and came up in, in Goldman Sachs and he was mentored for five or seven years and he just didn't become partner overnight and then create the Yes Network and then became one of the head advisors to, to Hal Steinbrenner and George. It, it takes time and the problem with some of these Airbnbs and all these great stories, Robin Hood and DraftKings, is that kids today think they don't have to go the Jerry Carnell way. And, and to me, that's a mistake. Because for me, uh, you know, if you can go to business school, go to business school. If you can go to the minor leagues for four or five years, make sure you're ready when you get to the big leagues because you don't want to come back. And that's true in business and in baseball. Yeah, we had Trevor Bauer, for instance. He was on earlier. We have a Division three hockey player on earlier. What's your advice to Trevor Bauer, who's about to cash in, to the Division Three hockey player who has 100,000 eyeballs on his YouTube channel, is the advice the same or are there divergent paths for megastar athlete or just an athlete in general looking to make his way in the business world? I would probably say three things, but before that I would say that investing is a little bit like, like a chameleon. You have to be a good poker player. I wish you had you know, just a, a pad that you can say, okay, Every deal like this, you do it like this. Every deal like this, you do it like that. Jerry's done 700 different things. He forgot more than I, I, I would ever know. But guess what? If I'm going to do a media business, the first guy I'm calling is Jerry. And, and if Jerry's going to do something in baseball, he'll probably give me a call, right? And that's the power of relationships. In business, we love to collaborate. For some reason, athletes and entertainers, they're like, okay, don't call Scott. Don't call Jerry. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to do this deal all by myself. And it's a bad deal, right? It's, it's counterintuitive. And I think what, what Jerry's doing with, with the PA, player associations, both 
in, in Major League Baseball and NFL, I think is a wonderful thing and has passed overdue. I wish Jerry was there when I was in the union because you have all this power collectively, all this W-2 income that you can do so many incredible things and plan for the future. But here are my three, Scott. I would say number one is VCP, is vision, capital, and people. You gotta have the vision, you gotta have enough capital, and then you have the right people in place to do great things. Number two, I would say stay in your circle of competence. If you're an athlete and you don't know anything about gas and oil, probably stay away from gas and oil. Something you understand, that's something that Mr. Warren Buffett taught me a long time ago. And then I would always say, find a great business, find the right management team, and pay a fair price. Um, there's too many people out there trying to find bargains. With bargains comes a lot of headaches and a lot of lost dollars. Yeah. Jerry, what's what's your take on what Alex just said in terms of athletes actually maybe not being good at this? Joe Maloof told me once he kept his players out of his casinos because the mindset of the athlete is always, I can win. Even if it's just a statistical analysis of gambling, you will lose. Still, right. the mindset is, I can win. Do the athletes have to get over that this mindset? Yeah, it's not just the athletes, it's young people today. Uh, and, and Alex is right. I mean, you have to, you know, the one benefit I got, one of the many benefits I got from Goldman Sachs is you learn to pay your dues and you learn to go to boot camp and you learn to grind it out. Uh, that's lost in today's world where, you know, you've got, you know, people in their 20s who think they can be CEOs uh, just because they have a great idea. Now, you know, I'm not, you know, there, there's tremendous wealth creation that's that's happened and that is happening by virtue of these great ideas. So I'm not trying to take anything away from that. But when it comes to the question of individuals who have real IP around them by virtue of their performance in one area, Alex's VCP is spot on. You know, one of the things Alex had from the very beginning, remember what I said in the beginning of this conversation, one of the things I loved about Alex is he had the humility as a, as a guy who was at the top of his profession, he had the humility to say, I don't know in these areas and I want to get better. And, and his first instinct was to put really smart people around him. And so, you know, and, and people who had experience and that I think has served you really well, Alex, and, and, and you continue to do that. And so that's number one. And then number two, I would say, you know, athletes, this, this, this silver bullet type mentality where you're just going to hit it. Right. And is, 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 you know, that's, that's like going to Vegas and, and, and playing, you know, uh, in Vegas, it, it, you, people have got to get more used to building. And, you know, my style of investing over the last close to 30 years now has been to put more money to work around a piece of intellectual property after the initial investment, where I can actually build on it with much greater price transparency, a much greater sense of the risk, much greater sense of what the problems are, much greater sense of what we didn't know going into it and we're speculating. And if you do that, what you will find is that is a much better way to invest. So instead of writing a $500 million check into something right up front, you know, what I try to do is find a way to write 10, $50 million checks over a period of time. And all along that way, you're putting more people around you and you're doing the VCP thing that Alex talked about. And you'll find on a risk adjusted basis, an athlete, if he did that, and he put the right people around him and he thought about not getting not a big score binarily, you know, overnight, but, you know, a score that's more singles and doubles over time. No pun intended, Alex, um, given who we have on the call here. That is a probably better way to go. And we've that pendulum has got to swing back in our culture because it's not just with athletes. It's with everybody. And, you know, you could do both. But I would tell you the best advice I would give athletes today is build your build foundation stone after foundation stone around your intellectual property and find the right inputs to help monetize that over a consistent and long period of time. Right. In my world, I see it. Prospective sports writers or sports wannabes in journalism, they just say, well, I love sports and I, and I want to do what you do. How do I do it? And I ask, well, what are you doing right now? Do you see that, Alex, that people coming to you perhaps underestimate how hard it is and the work they need to put in to build that foundation? Oh yeah, I mean, look, it's taken me two decades to to try to get it right, and I'm still far away from getting it uh, institutional. I'm, I'm I'm interviewing a a great woman who's a lawyer and uh, uh, has a law degree, and uh, one of the the senior partners at Blackstone uh, highly recommended her. She was there for about ten years, and is that kind of person that he told me that I need to be able to institutionalize a Rock Corp. Um, especially if we ever want to go public one day or take one of our 
our company is public through a SPAC. Um, and, and those are the kind of things that takes time to bring in. And the one thing I will say is if I was 25 years old, I would try to find uh, uh, someone like Jerry in my community, someone with his talent, with education, with his experience, and then I would say, how can you and I be aligned? The problem with athletes and entertainment, everyone has a business manager, but there is zero, zero alignment. So if player X makes an investment and loses $100 million, Jerry loses zero. He still co collects his coupon every year. I think that has to be shifted upside down, right? And then what's going to happen is you're going to force the business manager to surround himself with an A team because the future, the the destiny of his future depends whether the investments are good or bad. Right. So give me that arc for A Rod Corp. What, uh, I'm always interested. You hear maybe we'll take a piece of it public or the 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 word du jour in sport and finance right now is SPAC. Of course, Jerry's looking in that world as well. Um, where's that arc? What do you see? What are the hopes? Yeah, so, so I, I think we, we like to stick to, to our knitting, right? And, and that's something you hear often, but we've been in real estate for over 20 years. That's what we do really, really well. And we have a headquarters down in uh, Coconut Grove in South Florida. And then we have our venture arm over in uh, West Hollywood in LA. And we have a portfolio of about 30 companies uh, in which we're taking one public this year through a SPAC and maybe another two next year. And uh, we're also looking at some opportunities with the SPAC. So maybe playing both sides of that, but really taking a cautious effort. Again, I never want to be one of uh, 500. When I said I saw Jerry's SPAC, I said, boy, that's something that I would want to do business with because it's specific. He's got supreme talent around him uh, and he brings himself. He's a superpower. With me and Jennifer, I think we have a unique, um, you know, alpha that we can bring to the marketplace. And, and if we have a great partner with us, uh, that could be an interesting story. So we're in the early stage of looking at something. But uh, again, we just don't want to be one of many. Yeah, these days I hear from all deal makers, especially in the sports world, anybody can be an LP if they bring the capital. Mm -hmm. But I'm hearing now more and more from GPs is what's the added value? What's the value add to this person in my group? So I would say to you, mm -hmm. Jerry, you look at Alex and Alex, you look at yourself. What's the value add in, in, in A-Rod and J-Lo? Where, where can you drive value best? And Jerry, I'm curious from your perspective, how would you see it? Well, look, I mean, uh, I, I st always start from the premise that capital is fungible. You know, in the old days, when I first first starting out 30 years ago, having capital actually was a differentiator. Today, yeah. everybody, today everybody's got capital. And the easiest thing in the world, and one of the things I try to teach some of the younger people, even at my firm, is that pulling the trigger and making an investment is easy. What's not so easy is owning it well. And what we really try to do is own these things well. And that can take many different forms. You know, when I look at your question on Alex and Jennifer, you know, I see an unbelievable amount of intellectual property, both in them individually and, and hub and spoke, all the th various things that they can touch. That beauty business that he, he referred to that Jennifer just launched, I mean, that's a classic case in point. I mean, there's a tremendous number of spokes around their individual and collective intellectual property. And, you know, I, I always think in terms of Venn diagrams. And so I would look at, you know, a core piece of intellectual property around two individuals like this, individually and collectively, with scalable capital and company building expertise. And if you can take the three rings of that Venn diagram and put it together, you have a pathway to real terminal value. And that's what I look for. Yeah, where, where do you see those, those Venn diagrams intersecting, Alex? Where do you know, where, what, what's the middle of it all? Say that a part again, Scott? Where, where do you, if I'm bringing Jennifer, I'm bringing Alex, I'm bringing the experience in those Venn diagrams, where, where's the overlap that you see drives the greatest value? Well, I, I think, look, when it comes to Jennifer, I mean, she, she's a media, uh, conglomerate on her own, right? She has over 250 million followers on social media. They're very active. They're very loyal. Over 75 of 250 million are millennials. So again, an, an immense opportunity. And it, you know, we, we think the e-commerce game is, is, is where, where, where we live. We just saw it two days ago when, when we sold out uh, in 58 minutes. But I think what it what comes down to, Scott, is, um, is trust. At the end of the day, like I trust Jerry, but it goes back 20 years, right? Um, why is Goldman Sachs such a great company? You trust the name. You think that 
if they're representing you, you have a competitive advantage like you do with the Yankees. But I think trust means that Jerry knows that when things are going great, of course, we're all going to pick up the phone. But if things are going poorly, A, are you going to pick up the phone? Are you going to show up? Are you tough enough to, to, to fight it out and, and, be, and have grit and perseverance? And ultimately, he also knows that if we need to write a check, we will write a check with him and we're not afraid of that. And that eliminates, Scott, about 99% of athletes and entertainers, not because of the athletes, it's because the business manager sits there as the goalie and says no to Jerry and then says yes to the easy. The easy usually ends up not, not so easy. And, and I've covered lots of deals in my 30 years doing this. And uh, obviously the Mets deal was one of them. What did you like most about that team, just as an asset? You, you know, you, you looked at it as an asset and said, this is something I'd like to pursue. It loses money. <laughs> um, yes, there is appreciation. We've seen sort of tried and true appreciation. But from what I'm hearing from you, it sounds as if from your real estate holdings, you like positive cash flow and appreciation. Yeah. What did you like about the Mets situation? So, so I think, I mean, look, there's no one on the planet that understands what I'm about to say better than Jerry, right? I mean, he's created the greatest regional sports network. I say regional, it's really a national network, the Yes Network. And, and this thing and is probably the global, right? Where, where we are today in scale Absolutely. and with Amazon as a partner, Sinclair, we're, we're talking global media now. Yeah. And, and this is a company that's thrown off over $400 million plus, plus, plus of EBITDA for the last, you know, many, many, many years. Um, when we looked at the Mets, we looked at it as intellectual property, right? And we it's just a real, real trophy. These assets are getting harder and harder to get, especially in markets like New York and LA. And what it came down to, the, these, these, these trophies really don't come on the market, but maybe once or twice over a century. So even though it's not what I was planning to do, when the opportunity came to me, I said, okay, this is an A-Rod Corp type of deal. And let me walk you through how I thought about that a little bit. Over the course of four and a half months, uh, we raised $2.5 billion of equity and debt. And most of it is equity, about 85% equity. Um, then we went out and our final bid was 2.35 and we lost uh, to, to Steve Cohen for 2.4. And uh, it, it was a great battle and it was great. I learned some tremendous lessons. But what oh, wait, wait, let me stop you there. Let, let, I want you to finish that thought. Give me two of those lessons. Uh, well, I think for one, it, it was it was a grueling process to do all of this uh, while more efficient, over 400 Zoom calls just like this, talking about our vision, about what we can do with the Mets. And I thought I put together uh, five great partners um, that all represented the five boroughs in New York. We had, we had Mark Laurie from Staten Island, we had Mike from Queens. We had Vinny Viola from Brooklyn. We had me from Washington Heights, and we had Jenny from the Block. And, and we Mike had was Jenny Michael as the well. vitamin water guy. Michael Cole, that's right. Uh, he, he will let you know. And, and we had Jen, Jennifer set up as the first, what well, the first, the, the one of thirty uh, first general partners women uh, to be running the show. And we thought that was a tremendous story. But you know, with guys like Mark Laurie, we had e-commerce handled really well. We we looked at this like like a entertainment sports media platform. And we thought baseball was just a small part of it. But through Jennifer, we felt we can drive the music with Live Nation business at City Field. With e-commerce, we thought we had Mark Laurie best in class, what he's done with Walmart. We could do the same with the Mets. We then thought that we can energize and turbocharge uh, the network by changing and, and mixing up programming a little bit and, and by even getting better and higher talent. and. Vinny Viola is one of the great hedge fund guys, investors, and you mentioned Michael Poli with marketing. So baseball was a small part of it. It wasn't everything. And we felt we can buy this for 2.35 and over time make this a 10 or $15 billion holding company, uh, much like the Fenway Group has done over at, uh, in Boston. Yeah, I mean, people left at Balmer paying $2 billion for the beachfront property, literally, of the Clippers. Uh, and, and do you see pro sports now and athletes? I think they, they need to understand this, that these franchises and leagues, they're no longer standalone businesses. And Jared, they have to be tent poles for something, media, real estate, technology, whatever it may be. If the thought process now is of professional sports franchises as standalone mom and pop, like we're going back a ways, then you don't understand sports these days. 
Yeah, look, when I when I had talked to Alex about what his thoughts were around the Mets, I mean, he was thinking about it exactly the right way, which is I look at these today, and I've looked at them for some time as mini Disney's. These are, you know, and and particularly any of these teams in the New York tri-state area. I mean, these are multinational entertainment conglomerates. The challenge is, is that they, you know, they didn't start that way. They've become that. Technology's both enabled it, and it's now more recently challenging it. Uh, and you got to keep evolving. Uh, and um, you know, the you got to the people side of it, the infrastructure side of it has to keep pace. But you know, it's really interesting. You know, in, in the United States. When everyone's looking for growth and when they look at the mature sports leagues and teams, the initial reaction is go offshore, you know, go to China, you know, uh, and and find ways to go to Europe. And I actually don't see it that way. I mean, those are those are obviously possibilities. But I think there's a tremendous amount to do here in the United States and in North America, because you've got to constantly re-underwrite and, and evolve the forms of monetization around these great pieces of intellectual property, and you have to run them like Disney's. And, you know, I'm, I very much admire what, what Iger and his team have done at Disney. And you notice they didn't rest on their laurels. They went out and they were ahead of the curve buying other great pieces of intellectual property and plugging them in to an infrastructure that monetizes them and doing that hence very accretively. I look at sports teams exactly the same way, and they've got to keep doing that. And, you know, the teams I've been lucky to be associated with, I learned a lot from them. I mean, they've all done that and they're going to continue to do that. And I think that's Alex. I think that's what you were looking, you and Jennifer were looking to do with the Mets. 100 percent, 100 percent. And the game, the world has changed so much. If you look at Amazon and we talked about, you know, Yes Network having a bunch of EBITDA. If you take that EBITDA and you take it from this column and you put it in the Amazon column, the multiples are going to be far greater. So. Uh, they saw it as an incredible partnership. The Yankees saw it as a great partnership led by Jerry. And those are the kind of opportunities I think you have to find that, you know, we felt that the network was differently owned by, by Jennifer and I than just owned by, by the Wilpons. We thought we came in with a different perspective, uh, perhaps, and a different competitive advantage and an energy to willing to invest and reinvest on what we think could be a, a great asset over time. All right, so if I'm looking at these ten poles, then as as e-commerce plays, as technology plays, real estate plays, media plays, I'm guessing you're not done looking around corners. Then, what else are you looking at, and what do you think is attractive in the sports space? Yeah, look, you talk about SPACs. There's been uh, about 14 companies that have traded uh, with a sports-related theme around it. It's a very popular theme, and if you take the Disney model. Uh, sports themes are anchors to so many great businesses. Uh, I think the gold standard, as I see it, has been uh, the craft group. What they've done up in New England has been unbelievable. The real estate around is probably worth more than three or four billion dollars than the team is worth. And, and, they, and they didn't have to pay a billion there. dollars for their stadium either. That's right. That's right. And, and but, but what they have over there is they have one of the, the world's greatest uh, visionaries in Robert Kraft. And then you have a black belt. Uh, person that executes as well as anyone and his son Jonathan so they make an incredible tag team and watching them and learning from them was something that I was hoping to bring uh, to Queens okay but anywhere else any other teams any other leagues anything else attractive to you you know we wake up every day and and we we, we answer the phones every day I wake up every day I think it's gonna be uh, the lucky day that I'm gonna get a call but we're open for business uh, you know Jennifer and I we're gonna invest 250 million dollars of our own equity into the deal which was <laughs> almost everything we had uh when i told jerry he said really i go yeah jerry we're going all in but when, when you have an opportunity to own one of these franchises and control it, it is a moat that nobody else has and you can say whatever you want about going this way with the networks and this when you have this um you see what the dodgers have done they bought it for 2.15 uh, then they turned around and turned a 25-year deal. They make $250 million a year from their TV deal. These are not sports franchises. These are media franchises. And they had 3.9 million people come through the gates. They have an accelerator. And an accelerator meaning they have their own venture arm. So when you think about Disney, it used to be where George Simon just bought a team. But now, to Jerry's point, these is going to be like an octopus of great businesses. And guess what? There's an opportunity to buy and add to your holding company 
And again, if the Mets own it, if the Dodgers own it, it's wholly different than just owning it by, you know, the young entrepreneur in Queens. Yeah, but people looking at it differently. That's why you have guys like Jerry involved out in LA. You've got Tucker Kane, you're Guggenheim, Mark Walter. You're bringing that Guggenheim perspective. And then you bring the operator in Stan Kasten. You marry the two and you got something there. There you go, VCP, you got it, Scott. <laughs> yeah. You know, a couple of questions, uh, A-Rod, we'll let you out of here. From Carlos Chavez, uh, Alex, why are there very few players with baseball all-star popularly struggling with branding and marketing? You know, I, I think, you know, growing up, and I think the three of us can say this, is we, we remember when baseball was number one, two, and three. And, and now we, we've kind of slid down to number three. Leadership group with Rob Manford and Dan Halem and, and some of the really smart people we have running baseball today, I think we have an opportunity to make a dent at that. But what the NFL and NBA have done so well is they've connected with the next generation. Uh, they've done a better job with digital. Uh, they've done a better job internationally with NBA has been in China for a long time. They have a five or six billion dollar business in China. Over 100 people on the ground right now working there. And they look at this more globally. I think Rob is starting to do that. We're doing it with Mexico, Montreal. Now you, we were in London a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it goes through social media, connecting and making it a little bit more pop culture. Go to the Hall of Fame. You want to see the big stars playing. You go to the NFL, you saw Jennifer Lopez just kill it last year uh, at the Super Bowl. I, I want to see that type of performance at the All-Star Game, at the Cooperstown, and at the World Series. you got to make it younger and more fun. So can I, can I try and see if you would agree with uh, – we have a question here from Neil Chenoy. He was asking about social media. Would you encourage teams and leagues, take the handcuffs off. Let's see the personality. Let's see the individuals. That's what attracts – the fans to the game is particularly the young demo that you just mentioned. My son's upstairs playing Call of Duty. He's playing Fortnite. He will not sit down, much less go to a stadium and sit for three and a half hours. It's just not what he and his friends are doing. Yeah, I think we've been the victim of good as the enemy of great. And uh, when you look at we've been so good for so long that in many ways we had uh, we had handcuffs on for, for 10, 20 years. And here came the NBA and they walked by us and here came the NFL and they took chances that we weren't willing to take. And the, the future is here, is the now. And you take what they call is our negative and we have to ninja it and, and turn it upside down by saying, we are the kings of content. We play 200 games a year. The Yes Network, the Yankees are the tremendous anchor to the incredible network that's worth billions of dollars. Well, let's take it a step further. Every day when I go to school and your son, if I had Aaron Judge here hitting in the batting cage live or, or in the off season for five or 10 minutes and it could be habitual and every day I can go over the top, guess what? You and your son, you and your daughter will look at Mike Trotter, whoever it is, have 30 cameras inside these batting cages, inside these weight rooms and just open up the floodgates. I wanna hear them, I wanna get to know them enough with trying to play it tight you have to let it eat I, I joke and jerry you'll laugh at this one but really mtv cribs was ahead of its time it yeah. was t it peeled back the curtain i got to see who these people were yeah 100 percent. can you imagine if jerry jones could have his own hard knocks show <laughs> what, he, what he would do with that uh and it's true you know you know at the end of the day you have to have a relationship with your customer like any business, the customer here is the fan, and the fans are going to demand a value proposition. Obviously, this well, is I great. Think the, I think the first step, Jerry, is stop calling them fans. Start calling them customers. You oh, treat I mean, a customer differently than a fan. That is true. That is true. Wow. But the value proposition is a two-way street, and they they will expect that you, that you as the league or the owner or the player are going to evolve in the way their desires for consuming content is evolving. And, and part of the challenge here is that, you know, there, there's the inertia is to stay static. And I think one of the things you'll always find the great media companies, the great entertainment companies are constantly re-underwriting themselves and constantly redoing their business plans organically as well as through acquisition, hence the Disney example. Uh, and um, that's what the sports ecosystem needs to do, without a doubt. Yep. Final word, Alex, before I let you go. Well, I would say this about our fans. They're the most important things in our game, in our businesses. And I'm going to take one step further. 
not customers, not fans. They're our largest shareholders of our game. And we have to treat them that way. And this is a terrible example, but the Kardashians who have done a fantastic job at creating this you know, multi-billion dollar empire uh, led by Chris uh, Jenner, who does such a fantastic job of leading that family. Uh, the world has told us today that more is more, not less is more. Less is more was good in the 70s and 80s, and baseball got a PhD there. Now we have to change the underwriting, bring in some really young people, maybe 20 to 25 years old from Silicon Valley, and say, what, what would you do today? And don't put any handcuffs. Just say, tell us how the game should look today, and you will be surprised what you come out and how great the game of baseball will be again. Right. Well, if you love these conversations, our next Sportico Live is going to be January 19th. We're going to explain our NBA valuations. We'll have Ted Leonsis. Uh, we will have Whit Grosbeck. We'll have Michelle Roberts. We'll have some NBA head honchos. Uh, we'll talk about how to drive value and, and how do we value these franchises. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great to see you. Thanks, thank Scott. You. Great to see you. you got it. Bye-bye. Thank you, Gary.